What's your favorite thing about your dad? He tells good stories. He plays good songs on his guitar. What does your dad do for work? Write books. He helps people be balanced. He calls people. Calls people and helps them be happier and spend more time with their families. What do you wish your dad would do more? Give me ice cream, Oreo cake, and all the sweets in the world. Hug me. Do things with me that I like to do. Like make things. What kind of things? Electric things. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Biz Dad Podcast. Today, we have Dr. Travis Perry joining us to chat about um, running businesses, balance uh, between uh, family and business and that type of stuff. He literally wrote a book on this, so it'll be fun to kind of go in on this and chat and um, learn a little bit more about his upcoming book and how he uh, uh, how he manages to do all of this with eight kids at home, if I recall correctly, eight kids running around the house um, from uh, uh, less than a year to 20 years old. So anyways, before I dig in too much on you, on what you're going to tell us about, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us about your family and then tell us about your business, please, Travis. Thanks, Adam. So great to be here on the other end. Um, yeah. So my fam, my wife and I have been married 21 years. We met in college. We started having a family right away. And the Lord has blessed us, and we are just really grateful. Um, we have a 20-year-old daughter, three boys, and then um, we have four more girls. So for us, uh, you know, life is busy, not just because of the sheer amount of going back and forth and doing stuff with all the kids, but my wife homeschools the kids here at home, and I work from home. So mm-hmm. you and I share that in common. And so my day might be, you know, a podcast like this and then me outside picking flowers with my two-year-old, uh, you know, for lunchtime um, or, you know, looking at the bees and how and teaching her how they pollinate and, you know, just fun stuff that my uh, family and I get to do. So, um, you know, a little bit about me professionally. I... Quite honestly, I, I love to share the stage with awesome people like you and podcasts on on uh, you know on conferences and events. But I also write. Uh, I'm an author. I wrote this book, Achieving Balance, uh, primarily to help the financial professionals of the world understand what workaholism is, because it really is a financial addiction, which we can get into later. And uh, my next book, which is coming out at the end of the year called Marry and Grow Rich, that is really for the consumer to help understand what are we doing? Like, what's this thing called money and why does it drive us in our capitalistic society? Is it really what fuels our motivation? If so, how is that um, healthy? And how is that something that can bring us together versus pull us apart? And I've made a, mm-hmm. A living of studying that at a PhD level, I have a master's in psychology and a PhD in family relations and human development. So I really have dug into the geeky, nerdy science behind all this, and I'm trying to bring this to the world to help uh, families, dads especially, to um, really be there for their spouse, their family, and, uh, and, and teach society that we should really be supporting this notion of having a better balanced life for dads. Yeah. I think that, I mean, obviously that's one of the reasons I have this conversation with gentlemen like you is I think the, the importance of realizing that um, a massive uh, legacy built on your wealth and business means nothing if your kids don't have a clue who you are um, or if your family has fallen apart uh, you know, some people are going to disagree with that and they're going to continue to build their thing and they're going to lose their families and, and, sure. um, you know, and it's, it's going to be rough to watch, but, uh, at the same point, man, oh man, I really hope that we can impact some dads to realize that that is not the end all be all, you know, it's, it's not about having a billion dollar net worth and, you know, 7,000 employees if, uh, your kids don't even like you. Uh, so, uh, there's a huge difference Amen. there. Um, 
Uh, so I want to rewind the clock on you a little bit because you weren't uh, always uh, the uh, possessor of a PhD and no. eight kids. So so let's rewind a little bit and go back in time and tell me if, if you can, let's talk a little bit about your dad, maybe even your dad's dad. I want to know what it was like for you kind of growing up, what sure. sort of uh, things happened in your life that led you to become, you know, a father of eight and, and talking about balancing life. Yeah, I'll start with my grandpa. Um, so my grandpa... Grew up in southern, well, I guess it's uh, yeah, southern ish Utah um, in San Pete County. A lot of Scandinavian um, uh, Utahns have, have basically decided to, to live there together and make that home. And he had a, a very strong Welsh and Danish background of immigrants coming to the United States um, for religious freedom, actually. And, you know, they. They fought hard uh, against the elements and um, <laughs> even um, <laughs> becoming peaceful with Indians in that area. There's there's a mm -hmm. lot of, of history, a rich history of, of being a pioneer, of coming across the plains and, and settling this area. So I have a very rich pioneer stock in my family. And that's been something that I think has really driven me forward to always be a proactive you know, achiever really want to, you know, achieve my goals and, and be in pursuit of those things. Um, probably a lot in large part because of my grandpa and his, and his, uh, his family, he happened to marry a Danish immigrant. She was 19 when she got on a boat to come to the United States, he spoke no English. And I love my grandma and dearly. And, you know, I can't talk about my grandpa without talking about my grandma. Mm -hmm. uh, because the two of them together, they make a different combination. And I know this now because uh, my grandpa was alive for eight years without her. And man, he he was a different guy. He was a different dude. Um, and I love him. And he just actually passed away earlier this year. So, uh, Sorry so no, thank you. It, long uh, battle with dementia and Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, Quite honestly, I, I'm sure those of you that have loved ones with, with those diseases, you feel like you, you've lost them years ago. And that's kind of how mm -hmm. I felt with Grandpa. I'm like, man, he's really already gone. I just kind of was hoping he would now go and be with Grandma. And so he did. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm excited uh, that he has graduated this life with flying colors and he, he's left such a phenomenal legacy. Now, something about my Grandpa, he grew up as an engineer, his dad and his grandpa, they built everything with their hands. In fact, um, so my great grandpa used to run in Manti, Utah, this little town. He was the town repair guy. And he, when radio first came to the area, he made sure all the homes in town were connected to the one radio mm -hmm. that they had. Like he ran wires to their homes and stuff. And um, when, you know, phone lines became a thing, they went to him. So the Perrys were uh, pretty instrumental, at least in this part of uh, Southern Utah, uh, of technology and hard work and, and ethic. And, and they, you know, they were someone you could trust. My grandpa uh, saw the writing on the walls. He grew up as technology was changing. Like, hmm, you know, uh, it's, there's something else out here for, for me to do. And he married my grandma and they moved to Southern California where he started working for a company called Northrop Grumman. And, you know, I see some airplanes in, in your background oh, yeah. there, Adam. Um, you know, Southern California is notorious for, you know, building planes, engineering. And so he got, he got to work down there. There were jobs. It was a job rush in Southern California. And a lot of people moved down there for to relocate because of uh, of jobs. But while he was kind of working his way up in in uh, various uh, positions, he kind of tapped out. And I, I know this because I interviewed him. I did a life history on my grandpa uh, before he passed away, and it, years before he passed away. Actually, I was very very fortunate to live close to him. And he said, "You know, Trav, I." I got as much education as I possibly could, never formalized through, you know, mm -hmm. uh, an institution of higher learning, but uh, certifications, education, on the job training. And he said, that is what brought him advancement. So he's like, whatever you do, whatever, 
you know, industry you choose to go into in, in, in employment, always learn, always learn. And that has, that has stuck with me. Um, and my dad was a great example of that, which I'll get to in a second. But I think grandpa got to a point in his career where he tapped out <laughs> and he realized that he was essentially just working for the man. He mm-hmm. didn't have a flexible schedule, couldn't do the things he wanted to do, couldn't spend the time he wanted to with his family. And every so often, you know, back then it was the evening newspaper and we'd recline in our, you know, cushy, you know, recliners and read the paper. And I think grandpa saw some advertisements for, you know, starting his own, your own business, doing this and the other. And he said, one day something caught his attention and that was an ad for a drain cleaning business, a plumbing drain cleaning business. And he thought to himself, um, maybe I could do that. So he called the number and they said, yeah, we will train you. We will teach you how to start your own business. And there's an investment and this is what you do. And um, he, he made the decision with my grandma that he would actually pull out his retirement. He cashed out his retirement and said, I'm going to be a business owner. And he, wow. went, he went for it, dude. He went for it. Um, they've had their plumbing business that has now served... You know, several counties, uh, LA County, San Fernando Valley, Ventura, um, just that whole area of Southern California now for, I want to say over 50 years. And, you know, this is, this is something that, uh, not many people can, can really tout like they own a family business, but my grandpa Mm -hmm. jumped into it, but he jumped into it with my dad. My dad uh, was in his 20s and was thinking about going to school to become a doctor when his dad kind of said, hey, I'm, I'm starting this business, but I need you. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you jump into business with me and we'll do this together and you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be partners in this thing. And you know, if you want to, you can pay for your school. Uh, and if you want to go off to school, fine. And my dad jumped into it. He was a young married guy. And I think I was knocking at the door if I wasn't already (laughs) in the house. And uh, it was time for, you know, to make some money. So I think he jumped at the opportunity. And my my grandpa and him, you know, started into business. You know, it's one of these where, you know, it wasn't all sunshine and roses. My dad recalls sitting around waiting for the phones to ring. Because that's what Mm -hmm. you did. You waited on that phone to call, you know, somebody to call you. And at first you didn't have any clients. And over time. You did really great work for people. They're like, wow, you're, you're the honest plumbers. You're the clean <laughs> plumbers. You're the on-time plumbers. You're the trustworthy plumbers. And boy, could you make a name for yourself in an industry where people get hosed? Yeah. Um, contractors. No pun intended, and, of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I could have said something else, but uh, it's a clean podcast. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, I, I think that um, as we you know, kind of look back and I've looked back over this for, for years, I was in line to be the third generation, um, uh, 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 for, for this business. And sometimes I still have dreams that I, you know, I I kind of taken over, but I spent a lot of time around Amaron plumbing, uh, was the name of the business. And I learned a lot about business, about life from my dad and his dad and my uncles. I learned about what it means to take care of clients, to that your name is your reputation. I learned, you know, the value of hard work, but also the value of being productive and not mm-hmm. just clocking in and clocking out and how valuable that is for the company. Um, but then ultimately how to to establish a, a well functioning service business. That's awesome. Yeah, the I mean, just being around that, it sounds like it was a motivating thing. Just listening to you know uh, the being honest, being on time. Like if that was the type of business that you were running, it, I don't remember. There was it was months ago, maybe even years ago at this point. I remember listening to somebody and they were talking about like 
If you can own a service-based business and be the person that actually shows up on time, you're already in the top 10%. Like you're already (laughs) there, right? So like just have good ethics in your service-based business and you're going to do well. That's like a minimum uh, standard that sets you apart. I, yep. I honestly, I, I work so much with my dad. He would always, he'd be like, Hey, come work with me. Come work with me. And of course he'd pay me. Uh, mm-hmm. but when I was a kid, I would just go with him cause he got me ice cream, you know, nice. you know, probably 39 cent thrifty cone. I don't know if you're, you guys remember mm-hmm. that like single scoop thrifty cone. I, I work for ice cream. Right. So, but, but there were times where we would show up in Beverly Hills or Hollywood in these mansions and he, my dad knew the code mm-hmm. and I, like he didn't call anybody he just knew the code and he would get in and i'm like dad what are you doing he's like well we go around to the back and there's this tree and next to the tree is a box and in the box is this box and there's a key and we can you get that key and come take it i'm like wait a minute like when did you become he's like people trust me I'm like dang no. they don't even need to be home he just goes and does the work leaves leaves the bill they pay and it's like it's a win win when you're tr- when you can show up and be trustworthy that goes such a long way these days how intentional was your dad on having that type of conversation with you while you were out with him my dad was very proactive um in having these conversations and I knew when I went to work with dad, at least when I was a teenager, a kid, like we're going to be listening to some Rush Limbaugh. We're going to be listening <laughs> to some Sean Hannity. We're going to listen to conservative talk radio, you know, part of the time. And then he's going to talk to me about world events. He's going to talk to me about, you know, politics. He's going to talk to me about my life and my girlfriends and family and my goals. And I saw that as his one-on-one time to interview me and talk to me, you know, and it wasn't just working for dad. A lot Mm -hmm. of times it was just, you know what? I haven't talked to you in a while, son. Let's go to work with me. So you can be my helper and I can, I can kind of see how you're doing. And I, you know, we had a whole day together. I wouldn't say that it was always a blast, but man, over time, over like literally decades of him doing this with me, um, I would even come to visit as a married guy coming to every college. He's like, hey, you want to go to work? You know, now I feel bad about saying no. And, you know, I want to <laughs> relax. But um, because those lessons now are ingrained in me. Mm-hmm. My father was 49 when he passed away. Wow. He uh, had a heart attack and died on a mountain bike ride. He didn't sit next to the TV and waste away his hours. That man was always working hard and was productive. And if he wasn't working hard, he was on his mountain bike. He was with his family. He was serving in his church. And the example that my dad left for me was not only the work ethic of this pioneer stock heritage that he had from Southern Utah pioneers from his dad and his mom, you know, as a, as a an immigrant, but knowing that um, family and God were way more important than work. Um, he would often actually point out some some other companies as we were driving by. Um, you know, he didn't diss the competition. He didn't throw them under the bus. But he would say, you know, Trav, those guys, what they do, here's their business model. They come in with a screaming cheap rate on replacing a water heater or like, and that's the thing that they advertise. So once they go in, they go around the house and say, you know, you ought to fix this and this and this and this and this. And by the way, there's that, that, this and the other. Mm-hmm. And it seems like that's, you know, uh, that's a great upsell. And he said, you know, then they triple, quadruple charge what what would normally charge for everything else. And again, big corporate kind of mentality is like their ratings and reviews are here, right? Yeah. They're way down here. And, you know, we're small enough that we can do this and we can charge, you know, a medium price, but we do an excellent job. And they have literally never had to advertise, never a day in their life. Um, 
And, you know, for my dad to teach me these lessons, I didn't know that it was going to be in such a short period of time. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that I'd only literally have him um, eight years as an adult. I was 26 when he passed away. Um, But he didn't just work with me. He played and he served. I served in the church with him. He brought me with him to activities. We did service for people. And he made sure that if he wasn't the one organizing it with Boy Scouts of America or something else, that um, I was involved with great leaders and mentors. And he would often come on those trips, even if he wasn't leading it out, just to be an involved dad. Mm-hmm. Um, one time we got to go to Baja, California for a, you know, out of the country experience. And, you know, Boy Scouts, back then it was a good thing. Um, <laughs> nowadays, you know, we don't, we don't even need to talk about where they've lost their way. They just have lost their way. Um, they're not even the Boy Scouts anymore. They're so. not even, the, they're just scouting America <laughs> now. Yeah. Um, I have I have my uh, eagle badge. I was able to earn that back when that was you know actually legit. But I've thought about just sending it back. Um, but <laughs> eh, it's not worth my time. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, this just sits on my shelf. So you know that said, he instilled values uh, that I, I think are important. And the trail that that he was riding the day that he died, um, I had ridden that trail with him literally hundreds of times, hundreds of times. Almost every single Saturday, we'd hit this, uh, what was called the Chumash Trail, which it, coincidentally, I and probably not coincidentally, is where I did my Eagle Scout project um, mm-hmm. in, in those hills on that trail. Um, I knew exactly where he was when people described um, the trail because I'd ridden with him hundreds of times. And you know, we mountain bike together, we camp together, fish together, we hike together. Um, my my dad wasn't just hey I need to go hang out with him at work, but he made time for his family. He made time for God, um, and those things way outweigh. Although it's important to know the business values and 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 how yeah. to take care of clients and stuff, those things are are way more important. Uh, my dad was also a Covey uh, follower. He was a Coveyite. He always had his Franklin Day planner. Always, in fact. After he died, um, they were, my mom was cleaning stuff out and she was throwing some boxes away. And I was looking at these boxes. I'm like, mom, what are you doing? She's like, ah, you know, they're just some, some journals. And I'm like, these are dad's day planners. He didn't keep yeah. a journal, but he kept the day planner. So now I've been digitalizing literally decades worth of journals wow. of his daily work and then his thoughts. His thoughts about God and his, you know, his, his church service and his concerns about me and the other kids and then work, you know, so I get to see it all. And I think a lot of, you know, a big part of who I am is because of his example mm-hmm. of being that dad. So I always wanted to be an amazing dad like him and give Give that to my kids because that's mm-hmm. a gift not everybody gets these days. Yeah, you are uh, exactly right. That, you know, like my dad's dad died when he was two, uh, when my dad was two. And um, I often wonder, uh, there's a lot of stories um, about who he was, um, or a few stories, anyways, about who he was. So I'm not sure where it would have been much better for him than his stepdad. But I look at my my dad's upbringing, how horrendous it was, and and then I hear stories like like yours, right? And I think to myself, okay, I get in real time to juxtapose two different styles of being a dad, um, two different styles of where somebody comes from and how how they got brought up. And we all have every single day a choice on how we show up for our kids, how we show up for our business, how we show up for anything in life. It's our choice. So if you can put yourself in those and juxtapose those two scenarios to ne- next to each other, say, okay, where, where, what style of leadership for my family, what style of you know, being a dad do I want to represent more? And be intentional about it. Like it will make a massive difference in your ability to show up for your kids and be there and be present. And uh, hopefully your kids uh, later on in life um, 
after you and I pass, our kids, uh, when we are much, 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 much older, after we pass, they can get choked up right. on call talking about how great of dads we were and how much of a legacy we left for them as young men and women. Um, not what kind of business we left them. Sure, that'll be great. I'm, I'm looking yeah. forward to leaving them a lot of wealth and you know uh, a, a, a successful uh, business that's operating. But those won't be the stories they tell. The stories will be much different about mountain biking or about yes. going camping or about... Um, I remember this story that dad told on a podcast where he sat down at lunch with me when I was two years old eating beans and rice, which is the story you told me right before we started this recording <laughs> that you, you right. changed your schedule and sat down and had that with your, with your two-year-old. Like it's a, uh, a blessing and an honor to be a dad and to be able to lead. And I am, uh, that made me super Amen. happy, uh, listening to your story and listen to, uh, you talk about your dad. Um, and hopefully Thanks, that, man. uh, you and I are both on that trend and people listening are on the trend of, of, being that type of father for our kids. Um, well, there's no as, question you are. I, I'm working at it. But, you know, I, my kids got me this, you know, the best dad ever. Uh -huh. and I think that wasn't because I am. I think that's to remind me every time I jump on one of these is like, <laughs> I need to be a best dad yeah. ever to them. Yeah. And, and I think that that's, that's the thing is like, we are, we're sent to earth in these families. The, I, I call them pods. Like God could have chosen anyway, but he put mm -hmm. us in families. He's like, nope, you're going to have a mom and you're going to have a dad and you're going to come to this family. And this is, this is your responsibility. This is our time to shine. So many people talk about, you know, serving others and, and helping. And, and I think that's really good. Um, it's very Christian. It's, there's values there. Um, but if they don't serve in their own home first, if they don't serve their own spouse first, uh, then where are their priorities? Yeah. So as I unpacked a lot of, uh, after dad died, I wanted to write a book for, for years. It took me 10 years to finally unpack some of these principles and put them into what a lot of people are calling, you know, a time management book. But really this is a book on priorities. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I call it the make time method because we all have a choice with our time. We all do. And how do we utilize that? Well, we can either let somebody else dictate that or a lot of our clients or the world or whatever, our anxiety, or we can make time for things that matter the most. And I, I start with a, a chapter, an introductory chapter about my dad. It's all about his legacy and his you know, input in my life that has set me on a tra trajectory to try and become balanced. Now, I, I totally blew this uh, um, up, Adam, and my heart was in the right place, but I didn't have the skills because my 1990s you know, upbringing, my teenage years, you know, go 1990s, uh, the music was horrible, but everything else was cool. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I enjoyed it. I had a great time. I had a great childhood. But man, the, the Franklin planner, the days of looking up how to drive someplace in the back of a map spiral mm -hmm. bound on the seat. Like I was the navigator for my dad half the time when we were driving around doing jobs. Now everything's digital. Everything is technology right at your fingertips. And so, you know, we have to change the way that we manage our time. We have to change the way that we make time for our priorities. And that's what I want to kind of reflect in this achieving balance. Stephen Covey's matrix that he stole from Eisenhower no longer, I believe, is very helpful. Um, and I, I've, I kind of fell in to this workaholic trap where mm -hmm. I wanted to be like my dad. I wanted to be like my grandpa. I wanted to have my own business. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to go places and do things. And it was all about me. It was all about mm -hmm. money. And it was all about how can I be successful before my dad and before my grandpa. And I want to make them proud of me. And it was all about me. Um, but like I said, my heart was kind of in the right place because I wanted to provide for my family. It wasn't just for yeah. me to hoard. It was so that I could provide for my family. I graduated. My wife and I graduated. We had two kids. Like We were having kids in college. Like People are like, what? What are you doing? I'm like, well, this is just what God has asked us to do and we're going with yeah. it. And you know, um, as I started kind of fall into this trap, I realized I wanted to have what I thought was a balanced life. 
which was doing everything for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I kind of could see that in my own dad where he, he, his priorities were there, but I I think that he got caught in this where it's like, well, I I have to be everything to everyone. I've got to be Superman. And you and I both know we can't make the world stop. We can't make it spin back around. Mm -hmm. Uh, We don't, even want to wear capes. Those are dangerous anyway, as we saw in in Pixar movies. Um, But what it really comes down to is that uh, we can't multitask. But computers, the invention of a computer has made us believe that we can Mm -hmm. because of the click of a button or the mouse or wherever, the flick of the switch. We're running on maybe multiple processors in our computers. And the computer is showing us virtually like what it looks like to be doing multiple tasks, but it's not even doing that. It's doing one task at a time yeah. and it's working on, it's just doing it so fast. So we try to do it and we end up switching from one task to another and we think we're multitasking, but we're really doing things slower, less quality. And at the end of the day, we feel burnt out because what have we actually accomplished? What are the things we've actually done? Mm-hmm. And and technology is a big part of that. So when I wrote Achieving Balance, um, it wasn't because I had this all figured out. It's because of I had to go get trained. I had to go get some coaching. Um, I even studied a whole master's degree in psychology to figure out the motivation behind why we want to achieve in life. And that, man, that really put me into a whole different uh, spin. Um, but what I would have been able to discover is this idea that if we can make time for our most important things in life and career is not our number one. Mm-hmm. If it is, I've literally met Adam, I've never met a married man with children who career is a number one priority in their life. Never. Yeah. It just doesn't happen because they care about their wife and they care about their kids. It's more important than them. Um, it's in, it still is very important to them. It's going to be a top priority. Yeah. And we spend a lot of time on it. But that therein lies the problem. Uh, most Americans, 60 to 70 hours a week. Entrepreneurs, 72 hours on average per week. They work in or on their business. Yeah. 72 hours. So what do we do? Well, Parkinson's law says we've given ourselves this much time. So we're going to take it. Mm-hmm. As Parkinson's. But if we can say, hey, let's compress it, we'll get the same amount, if not more done in less time. Sometimes even three to five times more because now we're focused and now we have figured out how to make time for the things that are most important at work. We take the fat and we delete it. We get it out of our work day. And we reinvest it in other areas of our life that are most are more important. It doesn't mean balance is not doing everything at the same time. It's not an equilibrium between work and life. That's the old 1990s version of work-life balance. Mm-hmm. But true balance is actually a psychological phenomenon. True balance is when we are in line with our core values and mm-hmm. we feel a balance in our mental, emotional, spiritual state. Yeah. And I, I would say that that means that you actually have to know what your core values are <laughs> to be in line with them, right? Uh, and taking the time to actually you know, assess what those are, build those, uh, not only by yourself, but with your spouse and potentially your kids if they're old enough, because um, it needs to be in line with the family core values, not just uh, you know, what you, what you want to do. And I harp on that a lot on this podcast is talking about we a lot of businesses have core values for their business and okay well this is our core values and we're going to make decisions we're going to hire and fire based off of these and then okay what are your family core values like do you make decisions in your family based off that what do you mean my family core values yeah yeah i mean we do it in our business why don't we do it at home exactly. you know like it makes a huge difference um as so these these um, um almost epiphany moments that you're that you're talking about here right and and seeing what your dad and your grandpa did and knowing that you wanted to do something similar uh but you know figuring out a way to do it differently um did they come before your father passed or after your father passed kind of how how did your brain start to work through these scenarios 
I think I started to work on it before because I was super frustrated because the business would go in fits and starts and it would just kind of, there was no consistency. And I was really struggling when there was, you know, a lack of work versus when I was getting referrals and working hard for people. I'm like, why can't I make this kind of be consistent? And that's when I jumped into, well, I'm going to do some productivity training because that's going to be helpful for my business. But instead of reinvesting the, sh- the, the, the time that I saved, I just worked more. And I became mm-hmm. what I affectionately call in my book, um, a productive workaholic. A productive workaholic is not the do-it-all. A do-it-all was what I used to be. Wandering around trying to help everybody appear like everything's fine and getting it all done for everyone. My wife, my kids, you know, my clients, etc. When in reality, you know, I'm really kind of multitasking on everyone. A productive workaholic is kind of a step up where they're like, all right, I'm going to be more productive. I'm going to manage my time better at work. But instead of realizing that, okay, I should take some extra time and now maybe go play golf for myself or maybe go mountain bike because I enjoy doing that. I didn't make the time. I would still work the same amount of hours because now I knew what it's like to be productive. And I almost mm-hmm. became addicted to productivity. I will say that again. I almost became addicted to productivity because it's addicting. As soon as you learn something, you learn a new trick or tip or, or skill. And if you're so focused on, I want to be productive, and that's the end goal, you'll never stop. It, it is an addiction in and of itself. So I caution people. I say, hey, productivity is not the magic pill in and of itself. You have to have boundaries. And those boundaries are exactly what you talked about, Adam. They're your values. They're your mm-hmm. priorities. They're your core beliefs. And so once you figure those out for yourself, absolutely involve your spouse. Find out what your spouse's core values are. Find out what each of your children's values are. As a family, set down and create a mission statement around those core values. We have a yeah. mission statement. We say every morning after prayer and after scripture together, and you know it's something that holds our family together. We know what those values are. And that allows us to be like, we don't oftentimes have to regulate everything about what our children do. We can just remind them of the value. And they go, yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Never give up. Yeah, it's just not something we do in the Perry household. So I guess we can't do it. You know, it's just, yeah. it, you know it doesn't always, I'm not saying you use that to be you know, um, uh, manipulative to your children. But as yeah. a reminder, who doesn't need a reminder? I mean, <laughs> come on. I'm 44. I need reminders every day. But and, I, I and will tell you- We need to have you, our kids remind us of those same things as well, because that and, opens up the door to amen. allow them to call us out on the same thing. Amen. Amen. Because there are times in life when we're going to want to give up, and they're going to be like, Dad, we don't give up. It's just not what mm-hmm. we do in the Perry household. And you're like, you're right. We don't. Mm-hmm. Um, so those values are, are not just interesting. They're vital. They're vital. I call them vital principles. They are guiding principles of your life. And if you're not living these guiding principles in your life, you're actually, psychologically speaking, a lot of times bringing on self-imposed anxiety, stress, or even depression. Those are the three common colds of mental illness. Most mental illness, when we boil it down, will stem from those three. And that, unfortunately, is what most business owners, as I've come to kind of understand, um, you know, after my dad died, back to your original question of like, was this because of your dad dying or before, a little mm-hmm. bit before, and then right as he passed away, man, I was slapped in the face. I was 26 and I was starting to get things figured out, I was starting to feel more productive and business was working and then whammo. Dad dies. I spend two weeks helping my mom trying to figure out where she is financially. I pay off her house, her cars, not me personally, but you know, my dad's mm-hmm. life insurance planning was able to, you know, have a trust set up and things set up in place so that we could we could do that. Um, and while I was involved in that, helping mom, I also wrote my dad's obituary. I spoke at his funeral, and mm-hmm. that self-reflection made me really go, wow, I'm writing my dad's obituary. And people are going to read this in the newspaper, they're going to read it at the funeral. 
what will people say about me? Honestly, Adam, that is the first time, first time in my life that I'd ever had that thought. And I've been to funerals before. You know, they're not the most fun thing in the world. But when I stood in front of a thousand people, standing room only in in the in the church um, that Friday morning, and, and gave my talk, I couldn't stop thinking about what will other people think about me. Well, I have this kind of impact on thousands of people. There were there were clients of his, customers of his from his plumbing company. There were people he served on boards in rec soccer that were there taking their day off to come and pay tribute. Like I I've been to a lot of funerals where like it's hard to find anyone really um who's who's uh, been around long enough to to know he wasn't granted. He was in the middle of his life, but my dad mm-hmm. was super involved and people knew what he stood for. They knew his values and they wanted to support you know, us and the family. But having to go through that experience and write it, I realized I should write my own. And I know, you know, there are a lot of people who say, write your own obituary and think about life at the end and what would you change and do differently. It actually brought me to something totally different. When I wrote my obituary, I didn't focus on achievement. I focused on my values. And that, Adam, was the first time that that epiphany went off in my brain. Whoa, Travis, you've been focusing on the outcome. You've been focusing on achieving wealth, status, even you know, uh, advanced degrees, these things that are not going to bring you happiness, and you know that, but you're doing it anyway. Mm-hmm. It was just a slap in the face of what are you really doing these things for? And quite honestly, what are other people going to say about you? What are your family going to say? Most importantly, and you know, my faith is a big part of me, but what is God going to say about the kind of person I've become? And so I looked at my obituary that I wrote, and it wasn't like Travis fell off a tree and he, you know, it, it didn't matter. Like, it, none of that matters. The, uh-huh. the, the mode of death does not matter, uh, may, unless you're a martyr, you know, and that's a different story. But, you know, if, you focus on in every area of life what's a characteristic what's something that describes you that you've become even if you're not it yet it's okay mm-hmm. but you believe that you should be that write it down write it down it just became a free flowing idea and i have all 10 of these areas of life and there's a lot of you know life coaches that have their you know wheel of life and whatever um it's all a little bit different but all kind of the same um, and as you look at it, you know, you've got like spiritual health, physical health, relationship with family, friends, your spouse, community, fun and rec, career, finances, um, you know, and just, you know, personal development. Those are the 10 that I have. And as I looked at these areas, I started to circle the characteristics, the things that describe who I thought I wanted to become. And then instead of focusing on the achievement, I turned around and said, Forget all this goal setting baloney. Let's just allow these values to be my lifelong goals. And that was it. That was the epiphany that I needed to have in my life was stop chasing achievement and start focusing on becoming the person that God wants you to become. What if you only have 49 years in you? Mm -hmm. And that's what you got. What if I only had 26? My son was involved in an accident yesterday. He walked away. He walked away. It could have been, it, it could have been brutal. And I don't want to get into details. It's been really bad. It could have been it. What? Today, this could be our last day. Adam, I might hear from you tomorrow. This was it. Yeah. Did we live our values? Are we living them now? Because on our headstones, they're not going to be my bachelor's and master's and PhD. It's mm-hmm. not going to be my you know, years of service in a, in a business. None of that matters. It's going to be dad, husband, brother, son. It's going to be the things that really matter the most. And that, my friend, is where I, I decided, you know what? If I'm struggling with this, I wonder if other business owners are. And so I started yeah. taking this to my financial planning clients, which were business owners. <laughs> Excuse me. And I was like, you know, my dad was a business owner. 
And I know he tried and to strive and to live these values and be, you know, a, a becomer, not a, just an achiever. But I wonder if his stress-induced heart attack was at least in part of maybe running around being a do-it-all at times or being a productive workaholic mm -hmm. at times. And I dove into this deeper and found that in my psychology degree, as I began branching out, that, oh yeah, this is huge. It's a financial addiction. Workaholism in America is based on our constant need and fuel of, quite honestly, capitalism and greed without without you know a healthy dose of of charity um, mm -hmm. i do believe in capitalism i am a capitalist but i do believe that you need a healthy dose of charity to keep you humble and to keep your values grounded um and so i i think that as i exposed some of this and i looked into it i was like whoa there's one other key and that key is your spouse as a financial mm -hmm. advisor i saw dozens of people come in my office and the ones that were on the same page financially, whoa, they got it. They got it figured out. And they were able to realize their goals, not just financial goals, but goals in all areas of life. And I started to wonder, like, hmm, I wonder if this is the key to keeping great balance and keeping working at your personal goals while being successful at business. Mm -hmm. And that started me off onto a whole new realm of exploration. But I hope that I hope that kind of makes sense. It was a you know, it was a gradual before dad died. And then as he died, that really that really set me off. That that yeah. really changed just about every aspect of my life, man. So he passed away, it sounds like about eighteen years ago. Um, which means you had at bare minimum one child. How many kids did you have at the time? So I we had three. Three at the uh, time. No, excuse okay. me. We had two at the time. We had two at the time. Okay. Yeah. So with, with two kids at home, um, a wife, you already realizing you were kind of working working a lot. What kind of conversations did you have with your with your wife at the time um, while you know going through all of this? Because it, it's one thing that I, I harp on constantly is the decision of who you marry is massively important and your decision yep. to communicate with that with that person and be on the same page with that person is uh, yet again, even more massively important, right? So choose yes. the right wife and then engage with them daily, um, constantly. So um, that doesn't mean that I'm very successful at that. Uh, let's be honest. None of us are perfect here, but we're striving towards, you know, continuing that. What kind of conversations did you two start having and how, how was the communication then versus um, after your, your transformation slash uh, change in your thought process? So number one, my wife is the most important person in my life, period, end of story, exclamation point, exclamation point. And I have a picture that, uh, that th this banner, it hung in my academic counselor's office. And it's the 21 Suggestions for Success by H. Jackson Brown Jr. If you guys ever want to um, look this up. And you know, I, it's on, it's on my phone. It's kind of hard to see, and it's glary, but it's a banner, and I've kept this with me. This is back in my days of of uh, starting my education at Brigham Young University, and the number one key to success, according to him, marry the right person. This one decision will determine ninety percent of your happiness or misery. Mm -hmm. So I I've known that for a long time. And I've known the key to that, um, but it never struck me as important as it did until after my dad passed away. After he passed away, there was a huge void in my mom's life. And for a time, I was there to kind of fill some of that void. My uncle was there to step up, my brothers, my sister, we all kind of had to kind of fill some of these voids. Mm -hmm. and, and and until and I'm not saying that p single people are not real people. Not, don't get me wrong here, guys. But there is a reason that we have a spouse, and it's not just for procreation. Yeah. God could have chosen any way, um, but it's for companionship. It is for friendship, and my most important thing I believe it's for is for development. There are only things that you can learn. By being married, period. Um, 
that you will not learn in any other circumstance. You can have a business partner, but you're not going to go home and sleep with that. Well, okay, maybe some people do. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully they're married to them. Uh, the reality is that uh, y- you have to work as a team. Now, at the exact same time that all this was happening, my wife started having major health complications. Mm-hmm. Couldn't figure out what's going on. And she's never had, you know, had, had any major issues before. She's had some injuries with playing like three different high school sports, she's very athletic, yeah. um, very fit. And, uh, you know, we, we had baby number three. And after that, she's like, you know, there's something wrong. And she's trying to get back into the running routine and her knees started to swell. And so we went to the doctor and the doctor's like, oh, here's some penicillin or whatever for the swelling. And um, all of a sudden she found that, she was swelling up even more. And we call the doctor and he's like, stop taking the medication. We're like, yeah, we already did that. Um, We figured something was up with the medication. Mm -hmm. He's like, it's probably an allergic reaction. Well, we don't know to this day what it is, but we spent um, a a good part of the year going from specialist to specialist to specialist. She was even at one point up at a a specialist office at the state capitol who um, diagnosed her, misdiagnosed her uh, with rheumatoid arthritis. Mm-hmm. She's like 25. Yeah. And like we brought our, I, I think our infant baby at the time, and we sat down and they're like brushing off baby toys because nobody with rheumatoid is in their 20s. They're in their 60s, yeah. 70s, 80s. And long story, we start going on this health journey and we find out that, whoa, uh, maybe what, it, what we've been eating in this toxic uh, American diet, standard American diet is actually contributing to this. So we took kind of a full 180 um, this direction. And I found out that as my wife was like, I think I found the solution after going to chiropractor, energy healer, specialist, um, medical doctors, just the whole gambit and losing our health insurance in the meantime, by the way, Mm. because the, the guy who misdiagnosed my wife with rheumatoid I was at the same time applying for new health insurance for our family and they pulled those records and denied us. Now we didn't have anything. So here we are in a broken American system trying to make sense of it. And my wife and I sit down one day. She's like, I talked to a friend. I think diet is the issue. I'm like, honey, we've already kind of changed it a little bit. She's like, we haven't changed it radically. We need a reset. I'm like, what What are you talking about? So she sits down and, and she tells me we need to not have any processed foods not have mm-hmm. any cooked foods, not have any meats or dairy products or anything. And this is not like a vegan, um, let's save the planet. This is how do we reset the entire immune system? And I'm like, knock yourself out. I will support you. And after two weeks, she was starting to um, reduce the medication. The swelling was starting to get better. And she actually was losing weight because of this and was feeling much better. And I had this thought, a good husband, a supportive husband, that guy, he would probably be doing this with her, not just watching from a distance and clapping Mm -hmm. and supporting. And so uh, I sauntered out. Again, this took me two weeks to figure out because I'm kind of slow. And I came out, I said, you know, honey, I think I should do this with you. And she just, you know, tears of joy. I, I thought you would never, you know, say that. And, and, and from that point on, I realized if we're going to make a change in our family, we both have to be all in. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, trying to make big change in life. And I'm not just talking about like changing a little habit. I'm talking yeah. about major change. It can actually divide you. It can make you, um, you know, two two you know ships passing in the night. Kind of, hey, yeah, we're roommates, but we're not really developing as a unit. And Adam, it took me to figure this out, and my wife to show me this example of not only with our health, but we did this with our finances, mm-hmm. cleaned everything out. We did this with our media, cleaned everything out, and started over. We reset our children's education, and that actually led us to start homeschooling our kids. Yeah, um, we reset 
all of the things we thought about, um, you know, uh, our, um, I guess it would be our parenting skills. And we kind of did this with every aspect of our life to the point that we started to really be on the same page, not just have the same financial goals. Like I was helping my clients at work. Yeah. Man, it was, it was everything. Once we went through this process, I realized this, this has to be it. This Mm -hmm. has to be the key. Cause if, if I stop becoming a do it all and I become a productive workaholic, but then I become what I call a personal developer, someone that is developing on his or her own, it's a great place to start. Don't get me wrong. Tony Robbins, Brent Burchard, all these big names in personal development, they know how important it is to really, you know, work on oneself. Yeah. However, that only goes so far. You can become addicted to that process. And if you're not careful, you can kind of fall back into that workaholic trap that I talked yeah. about. You kind of you go back up the ladder a little bit faster, but you keep falling. But if you have that support person who loves you more than anyone else in the world, who's there by you and is developing with you, and now you're setting goals together and you're supporting the personal goals that you each individually have because you're still individuals. Mm -hmm. If you do those things, not only is that backed by science, it's going to help you have a better marriage, but I've done the research on shared values and goals in my nerdy PhD program. And I found that, you know, um, the 3000 couples that we tried this, you know, with that, the ones that had, you know, shared values and goals essentially were developing with each other. They were happier in their marriage. They had um, higher psychological scores. They were healthier psychologically. And Mm -hmm. that led to um, achieving their financial goals. Yeah, I a thousand percent could see how that'd be possible. I mean, the... I was I made that mistake there for a while of creating what the future was going to be for us, creating all these things, you know, like I was telling you, and running away. And it was like I am almost purposely outgrowing everybody, right? Because I'm purposely growing for myself. If I wasn't growing for my family, if I wasn't growing in that way, then yeah, I'm 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 outgrowing them on purpose, and it's going to throw me into a, a world uh, that is filled with almost disdain for your family on what they're they're dragging you back right and if you start to get to that point it's really hard to come back from so like catching it beforehand is is extremely important in in my non-phd opinion um so uh you know it just in in life experience of watching it happen like if you look at all these um you know, major CEOs, the, the amount, I mean, it, let's take a look at the, the, the top two here right, recently, Microsoft and Amazon, right? Both divorcing their spouses both. Um, and going both. like both of them, divorcing their spouses yeah. and their spouses go the opposite direction, go to, go other ways. Um, you know, was it uh, um, Bezos' wife married a, a school teacher, right? Like, I just need to be as far away from that as possible yeah. because you, you know, I don't know, there could be a bajillion things that were going on in there. But when success is the only thing you're going for and you're not going for it together, yeah. it, one of you is running away from the other. Like it's just, yeah. it's bound to, bound to create those problems. It's bound to, and it does. And I've interviewed now business owners. You know, getting out of the research is one thing, but getting yeah. into the minds of actual business owners, we've interviewed close to 1,500 now um, for my first book, Achieving Balance, and then for my second book, Marry and Grow Rich. And what I found is that the ones who had this figured out at the very beginning or you know really early on um they uh, every single one of them i asked them how important is your spouse in your business they said she is vital period um most crucial important decision is to be on the same page with my wife Mm -hmm. time and time and time again and the ones who don't figure this out oh man i'm working on my third marriage i wish i had figured out balance years and years ago yeah or my kids don't talk to me, or man, I lost my faith in God. Um, I'm you know eighty pounds overweight or whatever. Like the areas that, quite honestly, business owners should be examples in, they're not, and it's because a lot of us. I say us because I was there. A lot of us are addicted mm-hmm. to being a workaholic because it is a financial driver. It is a ego driver. It is identity driver in our society. 
And until we realize that as a society, if we only focus on what our identity is at work and um, how much money we have and how we can flaunt it on social media, Mm -hmm. until we start realizing that the family is the most important asset in the history of the world, until we do that, we will constantly have these problems. It will constantly be these challenges. And I will be in business forever uh, because you know <laughs> I, I help dads figure this out. Um, and not because um, I am Travis and I am Dr. Perry. Unfortunately, it took me so long to figure this out, to mm-hmm. figure out this method. And I was taught and learned by mentors and coaches and my own spouse the importance of everything I just shared with you today. And I, I will tell you that there is a night and day difference of working together with your spouse. We're not just here for the kids. In fact, research shows that the ones who are in the marriage just for their kids, there's a thing called gray divorce. Once the kids grow up and leave the mm-hmm. home, they look at each other and go, well, who are you? Yep. Uh, I don't know. Who the heck are you? And then they have a decision to make. Do we start over again? And do we have a, you know, a honeymoon type of relationship, which actually a lot of couples end up doing and it does kind of save their marriage? Or do we say, you know what, you've grown to be this other person and I've grown to be this other person. Now is a good time to part ways amicably. Yeah. And this, my friend, I honestly think this is what you're seeing with Bezos. This is what you're seeing with all mm-hmm. these other guys. And I'm sure there's other mixes and there's other details and problems. And I don't want to know their personal lives. But I will tell you, it's because they grew apart. If they had grown together, developed together, if they had been on the same team, going the same direction, they would be a pillar to the society. They would be examples far greater than their any business achievement in this world will ever give them. And again, I believe in repentance. I believe in forgiveness. I believe in starting over. I believe that some people probably need to get divorced because of, you know, a neglect, abuse. There's lots of things. Mm -hmm. But the majority of us, I think we just give up and we decide to not be proactive in this thing. And we decide that we're two individuals trying to get out of marriage something that it can't give us. Mm -hmm. More expectation. All of a sudden, we're going to get married and we're going to be happier than we were. Well, if you're not already happy and you don't bring that to the marriage, boy, are you in for it. Yeah. So, uh, so my, my second book kind of picks up where this leaves off. I kind of talk about it in Achieving Balance. My second book is all about this. Well, how do you do this? How do you grow together? How do you get on the same page? Mm -hmm. How do you make financial goals and keep them? How do you parent and be lovers and intimate with each other and um, and do all of these things to have a wonderful relationship while growing and scaling a business? Because that last piece, man, that that's the kicker. The first part I could name. Dozens of authors, John Gottman, others who have talked about this for years and years and years, and their principles are sound, but nobody understands what it's like to be a business owner and have an extra kid, an extra baby. That is your baby, and you feel so attached to it. And instead of understanding that that could be part of what it is that you and your wife and family are creating together, that that can actually live in harmony. Instead of being the enemy, that's where the uh, truly the whole marry and grow rich philosophy of having balanced growth of growing the business and growing in your relationship can really take off. So, what is what is you know you're talking about growing all of this with your family, right? Um, and family is is more than just your spouse. How are you? kind of presenting this information and including your kids in on these conversations as far as growing this type of business goes? Very carefully. <laughs> yeah. um, Don't I know it? Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I know you're, you're a real estate investor and you help others do this and I think that's fantastic. But you don't tell your two-year-old, this is a REIT. And mm-hmm. this is, okay, maybe you do, Adam. I don't know, but I don't. Uh, <laughs> I'm a weirdo, so you never know what I talk to my kids about. Yeah. Well, I, I know you're smart, and 
you impart this knowledge. And, you know, I want to teach my kids, but we do it developmentally. Mm -hmm. So what, what we actually will do as a family is we will have a family council every Sunday night. And we have a family goal for the month. That family goal was picked proactively by the family as a group from one of the values in our mission statement. Every year, we focus on a value of trying as a family to develop that value together. Mm -hmm. And we decide, well, this year, you know, what is it? Well, maybe it's adventure. Maybe it's, um, you know, spirituality, humility, whatever that is. And so then every month we say, okay, here's our value. What should we try and do together as a family to focus on this value? Half the, half the battle is just remembering what it was that we chose. So we've got a chalkboard and we write it up there and we can see it and we remind it. And every week, you know, we talk about it, we celebrate together. Um, so that's the family portion. And that keeps us as a family, regardless of how old you are. I mean, you can mm-hmm. be two and be like, you know, me, me, me go potty. Like that's, that's her thing right now. Like she's learning to go potty. Great. Um, so our two-year-old is learning that and that's part of her keeping her stewardship in the home. And our steward- stewardship is, is the word that we're focusing on this year. How can we better be stewards of our home, the th- our things, you know, each other, that sort of thing. And so every single person, regardless of position, knows that this is the goal and they can work on it. Two, my wife and I, um, because we develop together and we have our own goals and we have mm-hmm. our couple goals, well, then we sit down with every one of our children once a month alone. We have eight children. If we can do this, you can do this. <laughs> um, my dad, actually did this for me. I talked to you about me coming to work with him in his work truck, you know? Yeah. So here I am in my plumbing gear and we're ha- having, but there were times on Sundays where he's like, you know what? Let's just have a heart to heart. Um, come in my office and let's talk about your goals. So goal focused because of my dad, he did that for me. Mm-hmm. And so since my oldest was like old enough to sit on her own, I had these conversations with her. Nice. And we started really, really young. Now, if you're, you're thinking, well, I can't, my kids are too old, baloney, start today, talk mm-hmm. to them, talk to them about what they want, talk to them about their goals. They will have a different relationship with you. This will change it. And if you're struggling with your relationship with your kid, talk to them about what they want to achieve, what do they want to become, who they want to be in this world. There's nothing more important to them than that right now. They yeah. may not coin that as such. They may not know what their goals are. But you could say, dude, what are you interested in? And, and uh, be involved in that. So um, we take, we start, we kind of have a rotation, but with the oldest, we take more time. Why? Well, they're more dynamic creatures. Mm-hmm. You know, the 16 year old has a driver's license and dates and has a job and has a life that is pulling him outside of our family every day. So that time is precious. And so we probably spend a good hour or so with him. But as we go down the line, it's quicker and quicker and shorter and shorter. Yeah. But every one of them have goals in all areas of life. And some of those goals are very simple, right? Learn my ABCs and go pot, you know, learn to be a potty train this year. Mm-hmm. Some of them are very complex. Um, but our goal as parents, in my humble opinion, Adam, it is not to train identical human beings, and live through them. And I know that's kind of farsighted and some people really do get carried away and probably not your audience, but we know this. But my humble opinion is our goal as parents is to coach our children to help them become their best selves. And it's our job now to train them. You know, I've got a friend of mine who wrote a book, you know, 18, 18 Summers, and I, yeah. I met him when we were out speaking, and he's a great guy. I believe in the sentiment that we do have, you know, 18 years with our kids at home. As we homeschool, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to flex. This is a homeschool flex. Like, I, we have a little bit extra. We have more time than 18 Summers, yeah. right? So yeah. you and I, we share that in common. And I'm not saying that, you know, if you're not a homeschool dad, you're out of the club. Not, not so much. 
make time for your yeah. kids. That's the key. The key is making the time. Because I can be a homeschool dad and pretend I spend time with my kids mm. and really be on my Ain't phone. That's the truth. Like, yeah. it's, it's just as hard. You have to make the time. But my kids, you would think, ah, how do your kids take to that? Do they like that? They line up at the door. Is it my turn? Is it my turn yet? Are you kidding me? Even my 16, 17, 18 year olds, they fight over whose turn it is mm. to spend alone with their mom and their dad to talk about who? Themselves. Themselves. Yeah. Not because they're selfish and egotistical, yeah. because they need coaching. You think about all the coaching we spent on ourselves as adults, right? For career mm -hmm. development, for this and the other. What are we spending? on our kids to invest in their development. Oh man, we'll spend it on sports. Oh man, we'll spend it on educational camps yeah. and we'll do this and the other. But why not make the investment of time to be there for your kids and help them achieve their goals? You don't have to be the mentor. You don't have to be the guy that teaches them how to woodwork. Mm -hmm. You don't have to know mechanics um, to to um, help them find a mentor to work on cars together. Before this podcast, I drove my, how old is he? 13? He's, he's 13. I, yeah, he's 13. I drove my 13 year old son down the road uh, because there's a highway. Otherwise, we make him ride his bike. We have to get on the highway and go around um, to a, a, a lady in our, in our neighborhood who has a garden. My kid's a green thumb and mm -hmm. he loves gardening. And she's paying him to weed and plant and do all these things. And she's a mentor to him. So what I'm trying to say is like, you can be the coach, but yeah. you don't have to orchestrate every part of their life. You don't have to be at everything. And you don't, meaning like you can allow other people to mentor them as they get older. So developmentally appropriate, start simple, start young, be with them, help coach them. At least once a month, we're having these conversations formally with our kids. And then, you know, throughout the month, we follow up with them. How are you doing on this? What about that? And at family councils every Sunday night, we celebrate our individual wins too. Hey, is there something that you did this week that was towards your goals? We're mm -hmm. all a family together, working together towards family development. Uh, mm -hmm. Ironically, when I was in my PhD program, there was a theory called family development. And I said, hey, wait, wait, hold on. What about this theory? You make me learn all these other theories. Mm -hmm. And I kid you not, Adam, the professors there, even though they knew that this is a legit, real theory, they say, we don't use that anymore. So we're not going to teach you that. <laughs> mm, and I just laughed. I'm like, well, well but it's <laughs> anyway, it was a yeah. losing battle. They're like, you're not going to publish any papers, basically, and turn this in based on this theory. You're not going to get them published at any, you know, uh, you know, uh, news, you know, uh, not newspaper, but uh, academic journal, because hmm. that's all that mattered to them. And yeah. I, I was like, yeah, okay, fine, you're right, but that's still truth, and truth is truth is truth, yeah. regardless of where it's found. Um, and so I'm a big believer in you need to develop with your family; they're your team. Mm -hmm. And you and your spouse, you're the, you're the team leaders. So you got to start there. If the two of you are not on the same path, you will not be able to direct the family, not be able to help them. You have to be united. And if your kids see you uh, united, then they're going to carry on that tradition. Yeah. If they don't see you united, they're going to carry on that tradition potentially until something happens in their life and they learn from it and kids can be resilient. Man, if you're not on that path, my strongest um, voice of warning is to get on that path. Mm -hmm. Start today. Whatever you need to do to get on that same page with your spouse and help your kids to develop to their fullest potential. Yeah. I would so much rather my kids learn lessons from me than the world or some other random person that I don't know, right? Um, and I was, uh, I've, I've said this before on, on the podcast, but it fits perfectly in what you're talking about is I was in a, uh, a, a family go abundance event. Um, and they were talking about how, Hey, just the same thing you were saying. We all have coaches. We have mentors that we choose for ourselves. When was the last time you put somebody purposely in your kid's life to make them better, to help them grow, you know, and, you know, because there's skills that I don't have that my son may need, that my daughter may need. 
Um, and who am I putting in in that spot to fill that gap that I have? Um, and how intentional am I about doing that and making sure that they have the right people for them in their corner all the time that they can call on if something goes wrong and that they know that they, this person knows how to help me or that person knows how to help me. Um, and that's also you, you, you know, impacting their life. It doesn't, again, have to be to your point, just you, the words coming out of my mouth, but you know, they know that boy, dad, dad was intentional about ensuring that I had everything open to me, all of this stuff open to me, um, which is a, a great place to be. Um, but man, I, I agree. Uh, I, I have absolutely loved this conversation. I think, I mean, <laughs> we we went around uh, a lot of uh, different topics, and I, I I've truly enjoyed getting to know you a bit more. Um, I want to pass it over there one last time to see if there's anything that that has popped up in your brain, anything that you wanted to hit that we haven't uh, we haven't had a chance to to cover yet. I think that I mean we've covered a bunch of business stuff, a bunch of family stuff, um, and I feel like we could probably talk for another five hours. But uh, but yeah, is there anything that, that you wanted to cover that we haven't quite got yet? I'll give one last thing. Okay. And I've talked a lot, and I appreciate this long form podcast approach. I love it. Um, what about the business? So how how do you how do you grow and scale? Why you're mm-hmm. doing all these things? Well, again, the importance of being productive, the importance of of growing your business is is fantastic. However, you have to take it one step further. The balanced growth method, which I teach in the Marry and Grow Rich book, which is coming out at the end of this year, is not to just focus on family and couple mm-hmm. and personal because now you'd be kind of leaning outside and the business might suffer, yeah. right? It's easy to say those things. It's easy to say that I only work 25 hours a week and I take 16 weeks off a year to do stuff with my family and stuff I want to do and service. and all. It's easy to say, but quite honestly, Adam, any business owner could do that and their business would just suffer. Mm-hmm. So I think the most important thing of how this plays back into business is how do you get out of your business? You fire yourself. Now, I don't have an MBA. I don't, um, I haven't written, read every business book out there in the world. But what I've seen from the 1500 plus individuals that I've interviewed, the ones who are successful, long term of having these, this balanced approach in life, um, you know, we're talking four or five decades in business. They figured out how to get off what I call the playing field. Now, I played soccer. Maybe you played football or basketball on the court or wh- whatever, whatever sport it was for you. Maybe you need to get off the field or get off the court. Regardless, any team sport, because business is a team sport. Even if mm-hmm. you are a solopreneur, man, you, you, if you're not all by yourself, other people are helping you. And you've got virtual assistants or you you have technology, regardless of what it is, you have help. There are basically four areas. There's two in offense, two in defense. The offense is sales and marketing. Defense is fulfillment and service. Sales and marketing, um, or excuse me, fulfillment and operations. Okay. If you don't have systems for your sales, you will fail. If you don't have systems for your marketing, you will fail. Systems beat habits every day. They beat goals every day. If you have a system, uh, that's where you're successful. If you have a system for fulfilling for your clients, you will keep and you know retain those clients. You'll they'll become raving fans. If you have a system for your operations, your support staff, you know, etc. So what I suggest people do is figure out where are they best at, begin there. What are their five things at work that they should be doing most of the time? Outsource everything else and then look at where they need to now begin firing themselves. What system do they need to then invent, implement, and then hire someone or outsource to? If they can get off of the playing field, they can get into the coaching lane. The coach stands on the side of the field, calls the plays, you know, in football, or you know, um, pulls players in and off the field. They're truly the C-suite. They're the mm-hmm. CEO of the company. Most business owners have just created a job for themselves, especially those of us who are in service-based businesses. Why? Well, because at the very beginning, we sold our clients and customers on us, not our system. Mm-hmm. 
hey, I'm a trusted financial advisor. You trust me versus I am building a team and we will help you. And this is our system. Now, if you fail to do that, that's okay. You can begin now to tell your clients you're building the system. You have a system. You have a team. Build it now. The most balanced of every business owner I've ever met has figured out how to get off the playing field. The ones still stuck running around, trying to kick a goal and then running back and playing goalie, There's a, they will never get balance figured out. And they will tell me that balance is unreal. It's unrealistic. It's a farce and it's a joke. And I'm going to say, show me how much you play on the field. Mm-hmm. And they'll show me. And I'll, I'll see the map. I'll see where they are all over the place. Until they become the CEO, they're not really off the field. Now, some will be okay being the CEO and they'll want to stay there. That's fine. They at least removed themselves. Others will want to hire a CEO or, you know, in this analogy, the coach, right? Hire the CEO and they'll go sit in the business owner suite. Where mm-hmm. That's where you get, you know, the three course meal and you get to watch from, you know, uh, bulletproof glass and cheer on your team and be in your best clothes, right? You're not getting poured beer on you from behind you and people mm-hmm. aren't swearing at you. You're in a nice posh spot. Why? You're not coaching anymore. You're not practicing with the team and you're not making the calls on who's coming on and off the field. You're not calling the plays. You're not calling the shots. Now you're just monitoring. How is my coach doing? How well did my team perform this year? From that vantage point, you now are a true business owner. Mm -hmm. Most business owners are either on the field or part-time coach. And some, the worst ones, are doing coaching and they're on the field. Because now they're so confused, they don't know who they are. But true business ownership is just that, business ownership. Once they get to that point where now they're in the business owner suite, now they can invest the revenue that's predictably coming into their business into other businesses if they want. Real estate, investment, like, okay, great. But now you have an asset that exists without you. That's when you know you truly have a business. Mm -hmm. You can leave and go on vacation and come back and you maybe had the best year ever. Uh, and you weren't really truly involved in m- m- most of those decisions. It's hard for business owners to do it this way because they are so attached yeah. to their product and they're so attached to their clients. But that's also the reason why they will be, they will be stuck as a do-it-all or a personal developer or a productive workaholic. And this is what I found from all the research we've done now the last year or so. The ones who have great long-term balance not only have the family support, not only work on their own personal goals, but they figured out how to get out of the business and off the field so they can become true business owners. Yeah, I, I absolutely love hearing that. It's one of those, you know, it, have you read the book, Who Not How? Um, so with the book, Who Not Dan How, Colvin. right? Yeah. yeah. It's one of those things that <laughs> if you have the right who's, it makes your life so much easier to learn how to step out. Well, it doesn't make it easier to learn how to. It makes it easier to actually step out when you're when you're mentally ready to. I think that's going to be the hardest. That is the hardest part for most owners that I see is they're getting mentally step able to step off. Um, because if that's you right. put the right person in the seat, you shouldn't need like I hired the right goalie. So guess what I don't need to do? Go tell the goalie how to do their job. Like That's get right. out of there and let the goalie do their job. Like go away. Like you know what you needed. You know exactly. you had that one hour meeting you had with the goalie. How about you go spend that hour with your kids now? Right. Go yep. go go spend that hour with your kids and say you know what the goalie's got it. I'm going to let them do their job and I'm going to go over here. Um, and just not, not think about the goalie because that's one step closer to getting into that owner's box. Um, Amen. and that's an extremely difficult place to get to. And I'm, I'm working on that still. I mean, I'm, I'm still very much in the business as we're, as sure. we're growing it out and I haven't hired f- people out for certain things and it is a process by far. Yep. Um, yep. uh, but man, oh man, having that mentality and that thought process has made my life so much easier to just say, you know what? There's a reason we hired the people we did. If they're the right person in the right seat, as EOS calls it, the right person, right seat stuff, yep. then I shouldn't have to be on top of them all the time. I should be able to have the one meeting a week, know what's going on, and move on, make the right decisions. Yep. If if we're starting to see the wrong trend, well, that's what that's why I've got the view from the owner's box is to be able to say, Ew. exactly, trends exactly. are not going well. You know, ask the right questions. Doesn't mean and I need to run a- and fix it. It's ask the right questions. Yeah. 
And don't get me wrong, there are times when playing on the field is exhilarating. Oh, yeah. I played high school, soccer, volleyball. I ran track. I did pole vault. I did a lot of sports. And being under those lights, it's exhilarating. But that dopamine rush is the same, if we're not careful, of being a workaholic, of just, we can't give it up. And there are a lot of excuses, but most of it just comes down to ego, cash flow, and identity. Mm-hmm. If we identify, and I, I heard a, um, a, one of my coaches actually, Mike Shreve, uh, is, has told me this just the other day. I was listening to some of his stuff and he said, hey, if the reason why in America we say, um, what do you do for a living? People mm-hmm. tell us who they are. They say, well, I'm a plumber or I'm a pilot yep. or I'm a firefighter, wh- whatever it is. We tell them what we um, are, not what we're doing. It's a totally different mindset shift because if I told you like, well, I'm a, you know, I speak and I'm right now I'm practicing my speech and then I'm, I'm going to write my book later tomorrow. Like, Oh, okay. Yeah. You're a speaker and author. We try to put our, you know, ourselves in these boxes and other people put ourselves in these boxes. But anyway, I think the, the, the takeaway here, you're exactly right, Adam, is just if we can get off the field and recognize that we can separate ourselves from, um, you know, constantly having to run around, it will free us up more time. And mm-hmm. actually those who make it there, they are more wealthy than the ones running around on the field. They really are. You can get paid a lot as a player. Yeah. But, you know, you can sell your team for millions of dollars or trillions of dollars, but you can get paid millions of dollars as a player. Like the difference is astounding and it's the same in business. Um, And it will free you up more time, which is what the only asset that we never get back in this life to make a difference in our kids' lives. Yeah. Completely agreed. And I want all the time I can with them. Um, so get the systems in place now to be able to do that. It makes a huge difference. Uh, Dr. Travis Perry, thank you so very much for jumping on here. It was absolutely awesome to hang out. If people want to get a hold of you, get a hold of your book, um, learn more about what you're doing, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? If they want to reach me for speaking, go to Travis Perry, P A R ry.com for everything else you can go to my main website which is uh, balanceddads.com balanceddads.com that'll have all my books my coming forth book even stuff about if you want to connect with me on speaking that's kind of the the catch all and uh, love to to see um, you know you're following up with me i've got this book coming out by the end of the year called marry and mm-hmm. grow rich if you go to marry and grow rich book Dot com, you will see that progress. And again, I'll post that on balancedads.com. It'll be there for, for everybody as they're, they're going to. But thank you so much, Adam, for making the time on this. Absolutely. It was awesome. It took some work for us to finally get at the, the calendars to line up, but I'm glad we did. We got it. Um, so uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Please reach out to, uh, to Travis. Um, uh, look, grab his book. Learn as much as you can from him. Uh, as you can tell, wealth of information hanging out here with us today. So please also like, subscribe, leave a five-star review. If you're not going to leave a five-star review, then don't leave a review at all. Go away. Um, but uh, no, I'm kidding. Give me feedback. <laughs> uh, but uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Again, thank you, Travis, for jumping on. And we'll see everybody on the next show.